conférence très intéressante à venir dans le domaine des emplois en cybersécurité. Alors, elle s'intitule « Comment ne jamais être sans emploi, les carrières dans le monde de la sécurité des technologies opérationnelles ». Alors, la demande de personnes possédant des compétences en cybersécurité et connaissance des environnements OT et ICS et des infrastructures critiques n'a jamais été aussi forte. Si vous voulez vous assurer un emploi pour le reste de votre carrière, le monde de la cybersécurité OT a besoin de vous. Alors, pour vous en parler, Jeff Jones, directeur de l'ingénierie cyberphysique et ICS au Grimm. Jeff Jones est directeur de l'ingénierie cyberphysique, une organisation au Grimm, une organisation de cybersécurité innovante et tournée vers l'avenir, dirigée par des experts du secteur. Les services du Grimm s'appuient sur une vaste expérience de travail avec des menaces avancées, de découverte de vulnérabilités critiques pardon, et de démonstration de solutions significatives pour des problèmes avancés. On accueille maintenant Jeff Jones. Merci. Merci. My French is horrible, so uh, I'm going to speak in English, and I appreciate you guys very much for uh, having me here. It's an honor. Um, my name is Jeff Jones. I am the director of cyber physical engineering at Grimm. Uh, when we so refer to cyber physical systems, we're talking about systems that have physical effects out in an operational technology or industrial control system environment uh, that have cyber components to them. Um, The, before Graham, uh, I was honored to be working at the Electricity Information Sharing and Analysis Center where I led their threat intelligence team for five years, um, doing uh, cyber threat intelligence and other things for the security of the North American power grid. Uh, before that, I spent 13 years at one of the U.S.'s uh, largest electricity providers. I worked in every aspect of cybersecurity there and eventually fell into industrial control systems and operational technology kind of by accident. Uh, I started on the... Uh, on their uh, energy trade floor, where uh, I was mainly just doing IT work and I started working in digital certificates and then I got the opportunity one time to go out to a coal uh, power plant and help chase a wire and find some missing equipment and when I saw that operation, uh, I got the bug for industrial control system I ended up doing uh, in their cybersecurity division. I did network security monitoring, I did incident response, I ended up in their ICS uh, SOC, uh, where I spent most of my career doing, or most of the, the rest of my career there doing um, risk management and writing the controls framework to help them be NERC SIP compliant and secure uh, with their uh, various different campuses in, in, in critical infrastructure. So uh, who is Grimm? Grimm does a lot of really cool, really hard stuff. We have advanced, uh, advanced teams that uh, deal with quite a bit of reverse engineering and vulnerability research. We also are a client services firm. We do assessments on uh, operational technology environments, and our expertise truly is in that OT world. Uh, we have a lot of expertise in the auto manufacturing sector, uh, the transportation sector, and of course power, uh, natural gas, and uh, the manufacturing sectors. So um, our expertise is really built on operational experience solving very complex computer problems. Uh, we do a lot of reverse engineering and also a lot of training, which is what brings me here. So on to the next slide. Uh, you may have seen um, the ICS Village at various cybersecurity conferences. We would love to have brought that here. Um, it's very expensive to ship something that size, uh, something like that here. Um, internationally, but uh, we're hoping to have it at the next one uh, in Europe. But up on the top left there, we have what we call a cyber hive. Uh, it's a large wall, um, probably about 15 feet long, about 8 feet high. Uh, on there you can see in the middle is a big water tank. Behind it uh, is all the, um, the uh, connections in between, and we build these to show Uh, PLCs and industrial control equipment, there's some PLCs there in the middle, uh, an industrial um, PC on the left, uh, the HMI is the human machine interface, it's a touch screen on the top right, and there's all kinds of things that you can do with that. We build capture the flag exercises and training um, types of environments, they're kind of like a cyber range per se, where students and um, Folks can interact with them, not just physically, uh, but in a classroom environment. This stuff is all networked together, and there are different challenges that go with something like that. Uh, on the bottom left here is uh, a Ford Escape, uh, obviously all torn apart. That thing is, um, 
named 3PO. Uh, and what we do with that is we take that to some of the different conferences. It was at DEF CON this year, uh, where students can actually see what the insides of an automobile look like, especially the more they become interconnected and in smart technologies and things like that. Um, there's also some challenges that are built for students to understand how to interface with the, with the equipment in a car. Can they break it? Can they hack it? And uh, also we do, like I said, a lot of research for auto manufacturers uh, to help identify vulnerabilities and, and, and things like that, like smart cars uh, and things of that nature. On the right here is uh, what we call Cyber Town. That's about a five foot by 10 foot um, table that kind of looks like an air hockey table uh, and the the bottom view is kind of what it looks like flat that actually we built for a, a Canadian customer um, they're gorgeous they are uh, you can see the uh, nuclear power plant uh, mock-up there in the closest to me uh, the cooling towers on the right is kind of like a cyber city uh, there's a military base there's a train uh, you can see the train tracks that run all the way around there's working stop lights and uh, things that move on there and in the back right you can see the actual control cabinet that houses all of the contru industrial control equipment so students not only can see what that looks like in the field uh, but also interact with it uh, with this particular table there's about 90 capture the flag challenges in with it so uh, we take this around to different places and, and come Companies and we also sell them um, so that educational institutions, um, uh, military training exercise, they buy these and they can use that as their classroom environment and see real physical effects based on what they're doing on their computers. So uh, what brings me to uh, this class is, uh, excuse me, this, this conference is I want to talk about the, the huge need for um, folks with industrial Cyber, excuse me, industrial control system operational technology cybersecurity skills. Uh, it is arguably the biggest job shortage that we've seen uh, in recent history. Uh, if you never want to be unemployed, we need your help. If you have cybersecurity skills and have a desire to learn uh, ICS technologies, um, there certainly is a big difference in you know, IT versus OT, but cybersecurity concepts certainly transfer over, but you need to understand the difference in the environment, the difference in the system. Uh, that stuff you can learn. Um, cybersecurity can be applied to these technologies, and there's a huge opportunity for folks that are interested in that. So basically, there's opportunity everywhere. I'm going to dig much further into each of these bullets. I know that's a lot to, to see on the screen, but let me just quickly talk to them, and then we'll, we'll come back to the slide in a minute. There's so many avenues that you can pursue in the, I, the OT cybersecurity world. Though they do parallel uh, the more um, widely understood traditional cybersecurity disciplines, um, we're talking about uh, engineering out in this world um, as opposed to, you know, uh, an IT title that might be a network engineer or something like that. This is mechanical engineering, uh, chemical engineering, uh, electrical engineering, engineering environments by trade. Um, I'll come back to the slide in a minute, like I said, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about what's unique uh, in these environments. So in the typical IT environment, um, you're going to, you know, dress like we all here are t uh, today. Um, but the biggest difference is these environments are dangerous. Uh, a typical somebody doing an assessment in an OT plant or uh, an environment with industrial uh, technology, they're going to be in hard hats and steel-toed boots and protective equipment. Um, like I said earlier, m you know, my early titles were an IT network engineer, a support engineer. Um, when we're talking about these environments, we're talking about electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. They could not be more different. Uh, in an IT environment, there's certainly dangerous environments. You've got data centers that are, you know, running fans and wires everywhere and step ladders and drop ceilings and things like that. But in an OT environment, um, you might find something that is, you know, extremely dangerous and heaven forbid could, could hurt somebody or kill somebody. You need to protect yourself in these environments. You need to understand the sensitivity of these environments. Like I said earlier, uh, IT folks deal with network switches, uh, step ladders, and things like that. But in OT, you may be in very close proximity to high voltage electricity. Um, up here in the slide, uh, you know, in the on the top right, uh, I've been out in a switch yard like that in a substation. You can hear, you can physically hear and feel the buzzing of the electricity above your head. Uh, in the auto manufacturing environment, those robot arms are gigantic. Uh, they can hurt somebody. Um, this uh, steam turbine up to, to the top left, they can be as big as, you know, tractor trailer trucks. They're massive. Um, 
you're walking up and down scaffolding like staircases with you know steel grating on the floor where heels or pointy shoes could get caught um, at a chemical treatment plant or a wastewater treatment plant like in the bottom middle there you know face shields gloves um, you know you, you you can't touch things in this environment because um, you could get injured and then certainly you know those are nuclear cooling towers I've been at several nuclear plants these things you think that you understand how big they are until you've stood next to one. I mean, they are, you're just dwarfed by them. They're massive. Uh, the water rushing down underneath them, it's, it's incredibly cool, but it's really, really dangerous. Um, so you may see huge conveyor belts, um, all kinds of things, smokestacks, gas under pressure. Um, these are very dangerous. So you might be dealing with dirt, wind, dust, possibly extreme temperatures. Um, some locations, especially with like power plants, uh, that's where most of my expertise is, they can be in very remote locations, far, far away from like, you know, um, any kind of, uh, you know, buildings. They might be out in the middle of a cow field. I did an assessment in Alabama in the summertime that was literally in the middle of a field of cows. Uh, it was over 100 degrees out at the plant. And that equipment that's in those types of environments, they're built rugged. They're built to withstand those kinds of extreme temperatures. And, um, you know, uh, 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 swings in temperatures. I was also at a wind farm one time in the winter uh, with, with, you know, the giant spinning turbines that are hundreds of feet tall inside there. Uh, it was freezing, freezing cold, and the equipment in there is built to withstand that. So when I, uh, when I got the ICS bug when I was at um, the electric company, I happened to be there on a day that the coal was being delivered off of the barge out in the water. It dumps, you know, um, these giant pieces of coal onto a conveyor belt comes up and goes up a, another belt and falls into a, a rock crusher where they crush the coal down. Um, I was just there to find a piece of equipment, like I said, and um, I was just fascinated by, by the operation of it. And the control system engineer there said, hey, do you want to climb up this tower and watch the stuff get crushed? Or, of course I want to climb up a tower and watch rocks get crushed. Uh, and ever since then, I've had a passion for it. They're really amazing environments. They're definitely, uh, you know, if you want some variety uh, from, you know, a job where you're sitting behind a desk all day, ICS security is for you because you could be in all kinds of different places uh, and all kinds of different environments. So it's a, a really exciting career field. And like I said, we need people. So all that is to say that uh, when you're there, the biggest thing is to think about safety first. Um, the difference between IT and OT is the culture of safety. Um, it's amazingly cool, but the whole point here is that safety is a way of life at these places uh, because it can save your life. Uh, it's a different environment and it requires a different mindset when you're approaching these pieces of equipment. Uh, they are not made to um, handle, you know, uh, Nessus. When you're running a scan on some of these equipments, they were never built for, for even interconnected technology. They were all serial communications that are uh, unencrypted, you know, in clear text. They can't handle uh, the kinds of uh, scanning technologies that we, that we do now, use nowadays. Um, so you need to know your equipment and you need to know your environment because it could save your life. So basically, back to this slide uh, and the whole point of why I'm here. There are so many different things that you can do in these environments. Uh, and I'm going to touch briefly on all these because you know, I, I don't have a lot of time. Um, and I'd love to talk in detail afterwards if anybody has any questions. But I've worked in all these different areas in 20 some years in this field. And there's just so many things that you can do. Um, one of the biggest ones, obviously, is security assessments and penetration testing. Um, those are built, broken down into, obviously, the external assessment, where you're checking out somebody's, uh, a company's external footprint out to the world or out to the, on the internet, um, gleaning what you can from open source intelligence about what a company might do, uh, what they produce, uh, and then, you know, find out if they're, from an attacker's perspective, can you glean any information uh, about contacts at the company? Um, you'd be surprised when we look at these look at these environments. How many times we found just out on you know doing Google searches about the uh, the architecture of a power plant or a gas plant or a, or a chemical plant, where the plans to the plant um, are just public information sitting out on the internet. We can find out what kind of equipment they use, whether they're a Schneider Electric shop, whether they have Allen Bradley equipment there. Um, it's surprising. Sometimes there's even network architectures. You have to remember that these environments, these power plants were built you know, 40, 50 years ago to last 25 to 40 years. Um, the internet wasn't around back then. Um, these devices were never meant to be communicating and sending information over, you know, Ethernet and TCP IP. Uh, they speak uh, protocols that were only designed serial to talk to one another unencrypted. So 
you really need to know the environment and what you're dealing with. So an external assessment really starts with, you know, finding out what you can glean on the internet about these types of equipment, and then you start looking for entry points, VPN concentrators, and things like that, remote access points, and you go from there. Uh, an internal assessment in an OT plant, um, I was going to talk to this in detail, but I think, I think we won't have enough time. Um, but you start with somebody with an interview. You say, get me somebody that knows what you do here. How do you build what you build? Whether it's a widget, whether you're keeping the lights on, whether you're moving you know, gas across a pipeline, uh, building a car, whatever it is, without this thing, without this process, without this PLC or this uh, system, uh, we can't do what we do. And then you walk it back from there. You go and look at the interconnections between that particular critical device and everything that supports it and just go backwards from there. Uh, I could talk on that for two hours, but because we are not going to have time for that, um, there is a whole world of that, and that is very lucrative. Uh, my company gets tons of requests for that type of work, and there's just not enough people that have the skills to go out there and do this work at a plant. Um, the next thing is secure architecture. When you are part of the internal assessment is getting somebody to either, they, they likely don't have a diagram of what, you know, uh, how their system is built, but you can uh, do the work through the interview and actually you know, walking down and tracing down systems and the interconnectedness between them to help somebody design a secure network architecture diagram of what they've got that helps them with compliance and that also helps them in the future when something goes wrong, they know exactly where to look, what are the network touch points uh, that are important in the system and without them this company couldn't function. Um, doing that kind of work, building those architectures or designing those architectures is a career field in itself. Um, the third bullet there is uh, digital forensics and incident response. Uh, there's a huge demand out there right now, especially with the proliferation of ransomware that is, you know, getting from the IT environment, so from somebody clicking on an e a phishing email, um, something like the ECANS malware you may have heard about, uh, working its way um, through the uh, segment between the IT network and the operational technology network, uh, making their way into that and causing physical effects. If rans ransomware is just designed for, you know, for criminal organizations to lock down systems so that you pay the ransom. They just want to make money. They don't, they don't care what the target is. They don't care who you are. They just want to get paid. Uh, if something like that accidentally makes its way into an OT environment, um, they could shut down something critical. Uh, the Colonial Pipeline incident last year that shut down the fuel supply on the east coast of the United States, uh, that company out of caution when, the, when the, 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 the ransomware was discovered in the IT network, they shut down their own operations so that that would not happen, but it caused a massive impact um, to the U.S. fuel supply. So going in and after an, an event like that and doing, you know, finding out what happened, how it got in, and explaining to a company not only what happened, but how could they defend something like that in the future, there is a massive, massive demand for that uh, out in the field today, and it's extremely lucrative uh, for folks with those kinds of skills. Cyber threat intelligence, like I said, I was honored to spend uh, five years leading an extremely talented team at the Electricity Information Sharing and Analysis Center. We focus on understanding the advanced threats to something like the power grid, the North American power grid and the bulk electric system. Uh, most of our work is tracking adversaries and instead of, you've probably heard the term IOCs, um, IOCs uh, um, indicator, indicators of compromise have a very short shelf life. If you f we found that if you focus more on, tr on uh, paying attention to the um, techniques, tactics, and procedures, the behaviors of an adversary, and what they're targeting, you have a much better understanding of a threat profile of an organization. Uh, if your CEO says, hey, I, I read about this threat, on, uh, you know, the crash override or in Destroyer 2 last year, you know, do we need to pay attention to this? Is this important to us? Well, if you, you know, if, 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 if a, an adversary is interested in espionage and manufacturing and you're running a power company, no, CEO, we really don't have to w worry about that. Um, but really understanding, you know, what an adversary is after and whether or not you might be a target for somebody like that. Uh, I loved doing that work. Um, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, organizations spend good money on people that can really understand their own environment and be doing research, both open source and from whatever, uh, you know, sources that are curated uh, might help somebody understand whether or not they're a target and what you can do to defend against things like that. 
Uh, network security monitoring, I used to work in um, not only a security operations center, but as the company matured, we actually built our own industrial control system SOC, um, a SOC that was dedicated to monitoring tools like Industrial Defender, Clarity, Dragos, Nozomi. There's all kinds of technologies out there that you can put network taps out into the OT environment and get alerts just like you would in any other security operations center uh, on the environment. But the alerts to these types of pieces of equipment are different. If you understand um, how these pieces of equipment work, who they're supposed to be talking to, uh, and where that stuff is supposed to be going, um, you can, it's very rare to have an ICS SOC. You could be somebody at your organization that builds that capability out. You don't need to have a six-figure solution from one of the big names that I just mentioned. Uh, those technologies are amazing, and if you can afford them, awesome. Um, but there are things like Security Onion um, that's free or relatively low cost that you could implement at your own organization and get visibility and network monitoring uh, into your own environment there. Um, it's a huge, a huge demand because we found in most of the assessment that we do, uh, one of the biggest challenges that, uh, that, that ICS uh, organizations are critical infrastructure structure um, providers have no, uh, little to no visibility into the communications in those environments. It's a huge problem and it's a huge challenge uh, and there's definitely lots of opportunity there for folks that know about that work. Uh, vulnerability management is the typical understanding that everybody has about vulnerability management, but they're different in IT where in the traditional enterprise environment, it's always good practice. It's always a good idea to apply the latest security patches. If you do that in an OT environment, you don't know your equipment or you don't necessarily know whether or not that patch is applicable to that type of, 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 of system, you could break something. You could, you could um, cause something to not be available when you need it and somebody that understands the environment and is able to scan through and look at these vulnerabilities, uh, vulnerability announcements in detail and understand you know, risk versus uh, you know, the, the need to apply a patch um, is, is critical. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk about that further, but I'm running out of time. Uh, but there's a huge difference in vulnerability management in IT versus industrial environments. And then, of course, reverse engineering. Um, what we all know about reversing uh, it applies anywhere. Um, but getting your hands on PLCs and HMIs uh, and understanding how they work and the language that they speak, um, it's, it's, it, it couldn't be more different than, 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 than regular computers and, and um, systems. Um, reversing known malware like Crash Override or Indestroyer or Trisis, ECAN, some of the big things that made the news over the last few years. It's extremely lucrative, arguably maybe the most lucrative field out there. Um, helping the community understand how it worked um, and then how, what, what impacts it caused and then of course how to defend against it, um, it's certainly a game changer when we understood how something like Trisis specifically targeted a safety instrumented system. Um, that type of reversing as well as hardware reversing like I showed the slide earlier with 3PO, the, the, the Ford Escape. Um, knowing the technologies in, 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 um, in vehicles or transportation system, rail systems, power plants, um, and how to uh, assess, uh, excuse me, how they work. Uh, you can also um, develop you know, custom code, like a lot of software engineering comes from that type of work too. Um, you may be designing uh, code that does something specific for a customer um, to, to have physical effects in that type of environment. And then uh, risk management is another huge one. Um, I spent the, most of my career in that. Uh, people that know enough about the technical, um, all the technical stuff that I'm talking about, the bits and the bytes on the wire, and the ability to be able to translate and articulate risk to senior management and senior leadership is a skill unto itself. It certainly takes um, time to understand you know, what's important to the business. Uh, the obvious is keeping the lights on in a power plant, but really helping an executive or a risk manager manager um, prioritize uh, you know, the, the threats that they're dealing with and what it might mean to the business is a huge, huge um, skill and I don't know of any organizations that wouldn't need somebody like that. It's a rare bird that's able to be very technical but understand business speak and be able to articulate that uh, up, to the, um, up to the executive so that the risk management decisions can be appropriately applied. Um, lastly. Uh, cloud technology, I mentioned this yesterday in my talk, um, a lot of ICS vendors are, are providing solutions now in the cloud. Um, it's a major problem. The, 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 the concept of it is, is sound, um, but I don't, the community doesn't think that there is, um, that it's well understood enough to be 
putting a technology like that into somebody else's hands as far as security and it being remotely accessible. There's a lot more work to do. I, I don't have the expertise to make a judgment, um, but it's very, very new and something that's new and fast moving like that because the cost savings you can have uh, by using a cloud solution instead of your own uh, systems, just like IT, uh, it needs to be better understood. And folks with really good core uh, cloud cybersecurity experience that can learn ICS technologies, you can write your own paycheck. Um, wrapping up here, education and training. Um, you could work for a company like mine doing things like this, uh, going out and doing trainings at um, uh, different uh, conferences as well as uh, companies that, that, that will bring you in to, to teach classes. Um, there's a world of that and it's extremely rewarding. Um, you also could work for a company like SANS. I'm sure you guys have heard of SANS. Uh, CISA provides training, uh, the US government all kinds of things like that. And then the last thing is a solutions provider. Again, companies like mine that provide solutions out in the space. Um, there's also, you know, they build technical solutions, maintain them, um, sell them, and um, certainly, you know, offering services out to the world to make people understand, um, you know, what these technologies are, a huge opportunity there. Um, I am out of time. Unfortunately, I was going to get a little bit into um, the uh, type of assessments that, uh, that I touched on, but we're out of time. Um, some resources for you. GrimCyber.com is my company. Uh, like I said, we do all kinds of things out uh, in the OT cybersecurity world. Uh, SANS that I mentioned, SANS.org is a literal roadmap to all the different, um, all the different um, uh, disciplines in cybersecurity proper, and then they certainly have a section on, uh, on OT cybersecurity. Um, CISA.gov, uh, they offer free ICS virtual training um, on their portal. Um, so take a shot of that slide. Um, you can go through uh, a series of really well done and well architectured courses for free that can train you in this stuff, and then certainly things like this conferences. Um, it's been an honor and a pleasure to be up here. I'm sorry I had to go so fast to cover so much stuff. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me at jeff.jones at grim.co.com, and I really, really appreciate you guys having me. It's an honor.